Bloodshot, a psychological thriller. One actor and a series of eloquent photographs. Derek Evely, the photographer, pursues the mysterious subject of his pictures, Cassandra Ammons, across 1950s London, from racially troubled Notting Hill to the raucous entertainments of Soho. First week of November, 1957. Mrs. Crutwell, my landlady for the last six years, had today informed me that she'd be raising the rent on my modest accommodation by a significant amount of money which I hadn't got. I lived in a stuffy basement flat in the start of part of Pimlico. My rooms were damp and sweating. Plaster was coming out in chunks. The toilet was constantly blocked. And these I might add were the good bits. They say when an ant is drunk, he falls over on his right side. I don't know how they know this or what sort of person will perform such a study. <laughs> but I believe they are correct, for on the day when I finally hit rock bottom, when I was so potted, polluted, pickled and completely soused, so thoroughly crapulent at the crime scene, I, I couldn't even find the front end of my camera. I fell face forward on the ground. And there, on the grass, I witnessed one, two, three little ants walk by. They each took a whiff of my breath and went reeling over <laughs> on the right side. I had a few quits set aside. So I decided to finally take the plunge. I would take pictures and I would sell them. It, of course, had been a long-standing dream of mine, a secret fantasy that I had shared with one or two colleagues when I was sober enough to converse. But what to capture, what to snap? A professional once told me that if a picture wasn't good enough, it's because the picture taken wasn't close enough. Well, having been decidedly too close to most of my assignments, I thought this concept was absolute cobblers. I didn't want to be part of the composition. I wanted to disappear. Let the topic take over. Larger than life. I wanted to document life. Living, breathing, beautiful things. Well, the next day was more or less the same thing. Same coat, same handbag, but this time she took a different route to the park. Up Portobello to Elgin Crescent and down Clarendon Road. She picked a different park bench as well. A different book. She must have finished the last one. I could already see I was getting in tighter. This was good. Excellent. The laurel trees had me well hidden. The shrubbery kept me camouflaged. She stayed there for an hour. An hour and a half. Then she got up and made her way down a winding path and out of the park, again, a different way back, and up into her flat. The pictures were better that night. I'd got closer, caught something of her. She was a curiosity, a contradiction, an elegant figure with real class in a, in a part of town that was, quite frankly, a slum. Who was she? Why did she have so much free time? What was her relationship with Mr. Neil Ole Brody? Was she his lover? His mistress? Had they even met? Or perhaps he'd spotted her one afternoon in the park and was smitten. <clears throat> one o'clock came and went. And it was two, then three. I stopped at the tea by now. I was wondering if Cassandra would ever come. Then it was four. And I was seriously thinking about calling it a day when, finally, shortly before five, she appeared. Same coat, same handbag. Looking flustered. Ill at ease. Something was up. She moved faster than I'd seen her before, scattering up one sheep and down another. This was not a route I'd known her to take, not at all. 
We were miles off course. I had no idea where we were going. Then, finally, she cut up through Allison Road, which led directly into Holland Park. But why this odd way, this odd detour, simply to get here? It was turning dark, shadowy. The place was deserted. I didn't even know if I could take a decent photograph. I was angry with her for being so thoughtless. Of course, how was she to know that she'd become my meal ticket? Or, or, or did she know? Was she aware that she was being followed? Had I got too close, too indiscreet? I was wrestling with all this rot in my head when suddenly I realized I'd lost her. She was gone. Completely out of sight. I looked down one path. And then another. And then the accident happened. There was a crash on the street. The breaking of glass. Car tires screeching to a halt. Horns being sounded. Then smash! Metal against metal. I ran back to the street and, and found four or five vehicles piled up around a, a flame in the middle of the road. Where did it come from? What had caused it? <coughs> No one was hurt but was screaming and shouting. And a shot came from the opposite direction. It rang out from the park. Oh, God. Something had happened. I climbed over the fence, scrambled over the, the bushes and down onto the ground. Something was up with her. I could feel it. There was no one else around. I was shouting now, calling out her name. Cassandra! Cassandra! She said she had been raped repeatedly at approximately 2 a.m. or thereabouts on the night of October the 4th. She said it had been done to her by three men. Her boss, Mr. Alexander Kozlov, owner and manager of the Rexendale, and two of his customers at the club were there after hours, Kenny McKinley and Joey Bryant. Poor Molly McGarry was wedded to Harry, who never would be her own mind. She'd put on her best, she'd powder her chest, but Harry would leave her behind. Behind, behind, he'd leave her behind. Behind, he'd leave her behind. Poor Harry said, Molly, I'm so melancholy. holding on. <laughs> Who said that? Churchill? Elizabeth I? God bless them both! All right. I've had a sniff of the barman's apron. The barman himself couldn't be here. But I toasted his absence often out of repentance. silence. I rented it from a friend. I like being up, out, in the space, on top of the planet, away from people. I like the balcony too. Being able to stand outside and see the whole town. Well, most of it, what matters. The offices, the warehouses, the trains, 
traffic on the river, all those boats and barges and cargo ships battling it out with the seabirds <clears throat> and the industry. I mean, my God, look at that skyline. Excavators and cranes cranking away, scaffolding shooting up, scraping against the clouds. It's a miracle. Вчера, сегодня, завтра, вчера, сегодня, завтра, я не понимаю, я не понимаю. Покажи ты мне, когда, покажи ты мне, почему, покажи ты мне, почему, почему, почему. Вчера, сегодня, завтра, вчера, сегодня, завтра. I reached it, pulled it out, and placed it on the desk. Put in a sheet of paper, hit a few letters, something familiar. Dear Mr. Eva Lee. Well, if it wasn't an exact match, it was pretty close. Of course, I no longer had the letters. Ronnie did. But this style of type seemed to meet my memory. And still, the photographs. But who committed the crime? We have seen the suspects, the stage Irish comedian, the American saxophone player, and the Russian magician. The writer Douglas Post leads us towards an ingenious solution, only to surprise us with a swift, startling, and satisfying final twist. <laughs>